Continuing now our reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 11. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Mary, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Eventually, parents have to have the talk with their children. Now, I I don't mean the one about the birds and the bees, the flowers and the trees, the moon up above, and a thing called love, although that too. And I I don't mean the tragically necessary talk that African-American parents have to have with their children, especially their sons, about how to navigate safely in a world where store clerks follow their children around the store or where a routine traffic stop can result in death, that one too. But I mean, I mean the talk about death. A pet dies or grandma does. Or a friend in class who has suffered one of those awful childhood illnesses dies and the desk is left empty. Eventually, a child is going to ask, why did she have to die? Why did he die? Daddy, are you going to die? Are you going to die, Mommy? Am I? Eventually, that kind of conversation, among so many other things, shatters our denial. We can't always avoid the reality that death is always with us. It's the unseen, silent, but persistent stranger who is all around us and even with us, within us. We sense the presence of death, don't we, when we, when we age or when we're ill or late at night when we can't go to sleep and we're 
beset by anxiety or early in the morning when we're just not at all sure that we're ready to begin the day, which means re-engaging with life. There's something in us that pulls us in the other direction. There, there, there are times when we have to reckon with death. And it was true for Jesus and his closest friends. This story we've been reading this morning from John chapter 11 concerns Jesus and some people that he loved dearly, loved like his own family, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And Lazarus fell ill, seriously ill, gravely ill. And Mary and Martha knew that Jesus would want to know that their friend, whom he loved, was nearing death, and they hoped that he would come to them and come to Lazarus. But for reasons that are known only to him, he delayed going to them. He loved them, but he delayed going to them. That, that's hard to reconcile, isn't it? And in the interval between Jesus getting word that his friend was gravely ill and his appearing in the village with Mary and Martha, in the interval, Lazarus died. And we have these, these intervening stories where Mary and Martha, each in their, each in their turn, come to Jesus with some well, let's just name it, some frustration, some, some anger, some questioning about, we know you love us, so where were you when we needed you most? I'm no stranger to those kinds of questions, are you? I mean, we could, in a way, I think, think of our prayers as sending word to Jesus that someone you love is ill and we need you now. And then there's this interval before we sense that Jesus has shown up, at least in the way we think Jesus ought to show up. And in the interval, the worst happens. I'm, I'm glad Mary and Martha were able to say what they felt, and I think God invites us to say what we feel at the moments of such bewilderment and frustration and uncertainty and questioning. Jesus took their pain seriously. We read that he was deeply disturbed by their grief, by their tears, not disturbed because they cried, but disturbed by what caused their weeping. And in that exchange with Martha in particular, Jesus offers her an assurance about the resurrection. And, and Martha mistakes it at first for the kind of you know, cold comfort that we sometimes offer each other in a kind of cliched form. Oh, everything's going to work out fine. You know, and you'll see them again in heaven. However true that might be, in the moment of our deepest agony and grief, that's not enough. And so Jesus said, no, Martha, I, I'm not talking about that that kind of cliched, formulaic comfort. He, here's what I want you to know. I am the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in me, even though they die, shall live. And those who live and believe in me shall never die. Now, those two those two promises sound contradictory at first, don't they? 
Though you die, believing, trusting in, having a connection with Jesus, though you die, you shall live. This is the promise that the death we experience, the disintegration and diminishment of our bodies and our faculties, that's not the end. Those who die with me will live. You probably know the, the delightful and moving story that Henry Nouwen was fond of telling about two children, twins, in the womb. And he imagines that the twins are having a conversation with each other. And the sister, these are fraternal twins, not identical twins, the, the sister says to the brother, I think there may be life after birth. <laughs> and the brother says, no, this is our world. And, and when we leave this world, it's over for us. And then the sister says, I don't, I don't think so. In fact, I think there is a mother And when we are born, we'll live in her arms. Those who, who believe in me, though they die, shall live just as there was life after birth that we could not imagine. So there is life after death that seems somehow to surpass our hopes and dreams. There is a mother, there is a father who will gather us in arms of love after death. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who live and believe in me, though they die, shall live. And then Jesus says, and those who live and believe in me shall never die. And, and what that means is that Jesus, the New Testament, especially the writings of John, define life not so much as respiration and the coursing through our veins of the blood and the firing of our neurons. The, the Gospel of John helpfully tells us that life is about connection with Jesus, with God through Jesus. Life is about being connected, abiding in the vine, drawing life from Jesus, and that connection never gets severed. We are never separated from the life of God made available to us in Jesus. So, so yes, all of us will face dying but not in any essential sense. It can be painful, it can be bewildering, it can be disturbing to everyone around us, and it can be disturbing to us, but what we know is nothing, this is Paul in Romans, nothing in all creation shall be able to separate us, not even death, from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and to make evident, to make evident what he had to say to Mar Martha and to Mary and to us about the nature of these promises. When he got near to where Lazarus had been buried, now for four days, he resolved to perform this astounding sign. But don't miss that John wants us to know that Lazarus was really dead. I've never known what it means to be deader than a doornail, but Lazarus was at least that dead. Four days in the tomb. In, in the Jewish belief system of that day, it was common for Jews to believe that the soul of a person stayed with that person until the fourth day, hoping to re-enter the body, to reanimate the body, but 
But on the fourth day, when color had completely drained out of the dead person's face, the soul would leave. Any hope for reanimated life was gone. And, you know, the sisters say, you want us to roll away the stone? Do you, know what, do you not know what happens? When a body has been decomposing for four days, I mean, here we are in this lofty theological treatise, and they say, you know, he's, he's going to stink. And Jesus draws close to this rock tomb with a stone rolled in front of it, and he's greatly disturbed again. This time, not only, and perhaps not even mainly, at the grief of his friends, but he knows that it will not be long before he will be wrapped in linen and laid in a tomb very much like this one. So they roll the stone away. Jesus, disturbed and determined, grieving and hopeful, Jesus calls out to the dead man in the tomb, Lazarus, come out. And, and here he comes, like a mummy, you know, bound head to foot, face wrapped in a cloth. He's alive again. And Jesus turns to the people around him and around Lazarus and says, now unbind him and let him go. T to me, the power of those words is immense. And the invitation and responsibility it places with us to help each other is incredible because what we get from this image is God in Christ calls us to fullness of life, to ab abundant life, to radiant life, to glorious life, to life as God means it to be. That's what Jesus makes possible for us, and that's what he does. But he turns to the community and says, now, here's what you can do for each other. You can unbind each other so that you may live the life I am giving you. How many times have I needed the community of faith to unbind me and let me go? Maybe you too. Maybe bound up by shame. You know, this deep down sense that there's something wrong, not just with what I've done, but with who I am. And I've needed the community to say, no, no, no. You belong with us. We accept you. We love you. We welcome you just as you are. Let's take that shattering shackle of shame off of you so you can live. And maybe the bondage of guilt, this awareness that something we have done has hurt another person and we wish we could go back and do it over and not do that. But there isn't any going back. And we need to be set free by mercy and grace and forgiveness. And the community helps us to realize that God has forgiven us because they forgive us. We forgive each other. We unbind each other and let each other go. M maybe we have been, been bound by this, this chain of having been told over and over again that we're not enough. And the community says, no, no, no. We see so many gifts in you. We need you. Let us unbind you 
and let you go. And friends, sometimes whole congregations are like Lazarus. Real vitality is surging among us. The kind of life God wants us to live is here with us now, but but we kind of stumble around stiffly, bound up in whatever. And, you know, there's nothing to keep us from letting each other go and letting the church live with freedom and gladness and joy. Is there? In his not well-known enough play, Lazarus laughed. Eugene O'Neill imagined a scene in the host in the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus a short time after this miracle. Struck with, with what O'Neill calls wondering awe, family and guests crowd into the home, anxious to hear Lazarus describe what his experience had been like going into death and then coming back into life. I mean, after all, we've never been able to talk to somebody who made that journey except Jesus. And while they wait for Lazarus to speak, he, he's not quite able to speak. One of the guests says, do you remember him before he died? He used to be pale even when he worked in the fields. Now he seems as brown as one who's labored in the earth all day long in a vineyard in the hot sun. Another says, the whole look of his face has changed. He's like a stranger from a far land. And have you noticed there's no longer any sorrow in his eyes. It's like his eyes forgot sorrow in the grave. And another of the guests says, you know, we've not heard him say a word since he came out of the grave. But I did hear him do one thing. I heard him laugh. I heard him, I heard him laugh. What did you find beyond death, Lazarus? What did you see, Lazarus? Why did you laugh, Lazarus? And finally he speaks, and this is what he says. There is only life. I heard the heart of Jesus laughing in my heart. What a beautiful phrase. I heard the heart of Jesus laughing in my heart, and in my heart, Reborn to love of life, I cried yes, and I laughed in the laughter of God. Laugh, friends, laugh with me. Death is dead. Fear is no more. There is only life. There is only laughter. Friends, come out. And let's help each other experience freedom. Remembering that the Jesus who calls us out is the one who said, I am the resurrection, and the life. And he is in us and with us and for us. So laugh and live. Amen.